you know. Yeah. Good. So let's start this side event. Um, it's an extreme pleasure for me. My actually my first COP after over ten years working in this field, uh, and I'm happy to be here. Happy to welcome you and um, give a, a little bit an, an insight in where we stand and what experience we made in the couple of last years um, in working in, in this field, operationalizing Article 6. So um, I was a little bit afraid when I came to, to the COP and I, I, I felt like, well, we have now this side event on operationalizing Article 6, which is an extremely big word. And what what would we do if uh, the negotiations delivered in a text that renders our basically um, work a little bit obsolete because things work out through the negotiation text itself? Um, but I think this is, of course, the goal, the aim of the whole uh, negotiations and the path forwards. But still, I think it's worthwhile to share where we stand after the two years um, developing activities and, and collaboration on, a, on the ground. Um, we are the, the Swiss Foundation, Click Foundation, that is tasked with uh, developing activities to bring about mitigation outcomes, ITMOs, uh, that we need under the Swiss law to comply with our obligation, and we expect that to be in the order of magnitude between 20 to 40 million tons of ITMOS by 2030. So that's the, the target. And we started basically two years ago now and uh, learned a lot of lessons and also those who were joining us on that journey. Uh, we definitely learned that Article 6 works. Uh, both on the governmental level, but also on the development commercial level. Uh, but we also learned that it takes time and that we all know time is the essence and the window of opportunity is closing uh, rather fast. Now, um, we established a portfolio of activities in different uh, jurisdictions and um, it's a pleasure to share with you um, our learnings um, and have a discussion after that. We have a few interventions. Unfortunately, uh, the Swiss uh, delegate uh, Simon Fellermeyer is in um, ministerial consultations and most probably also um, in Valle from Senegal. So they, they are not here, but instead I'm very happy to <laughs> have Axel Michael over here. Um, Tergi, Quadri and Maya, and that's the difficult part. <laughs> okay, Ken, you might know, and Michael, my colleague. So, Michael will start uh, presenting where we stand in the procurement process, our portfolio, brief interventions, and then I would ask Axel to, to give his um, digest on the topic and continue with Maya which is very, yeah, new in that setting, with Georgia having a bilateral agreement with Switzerland and started an, a tender on a uh, um, building efficiency program under Article 6. And then the two project developers, Sergey and Ken, will give an insight in, in the work. Good, without further ado, I hand over to Michael and pull up the slides. Now, good. Floor is yours. Thank you, Misha. Warm welcome from my side as well. Michael Brenner, my name, uh, working with Misha on that, well, tremendous task to uh, procure these millions of ATMOS in the next couple of next few years. As Misha said, uh, time is running out to develop a program. It, need, it takes years to get it authorized under a bilateral agreement uh, under Article 6.2 as well. It takes a lot of time 
if you count that all together, uh, it, only a few vintages remain to generate these mitigation outcomes we require. Therefore, we have already started quite a while ago procuring uh, suitable programs. We have our eligibility criteria. We have some guidance from the Swiss government, of course. And um, I'm very glad that we have already made quite some progress. I would like to present here our, yeah, how far we got so far. So we have launched in the last two years, three tenders. We call them call for proposals where we ask the private sector and government institutions to provide suitable uh, Article 6.2 program ideas. We have so far received 78 such programs we have uh, analyzed them and uh, unfortunately had to, as always, had to exclude quite a, quite a fraction of, of the received programs due to uh, several reasons, but um, mainly due to non-compliance with our requirements or with the Swiss requirements. So now we have... They what? Connection. It's the connection. Ah, the hit, hit. Better? No? We take it as it is. Thank you, Sergei. <laughs> so, out of these 78, we have to uh, we had to refuse 47. We have um, nine programs currently under under review, and we have pre-selected uh, 22 programs. That means they have been approved by the Click Board uh, to uh, go ahead and fund the development of these programs in detail noting that it is very difficult at this point in time for the private sector to take that these risks, political risks specifically when no bilateral agreement is enforced between Switzerland and the transferring country, but also uh, uh, technological risks. Will it work? How will it be acceptable by Switzerland, the transferring country and by the Click Foundation? These questions are always kind of very difficult to answer at an early stage, so that's why we, the Click Foundation, is ready to, to, to finance these development, these program developments in the form of a mitigation activity design document. The ones of you who are familiar with CDM, that's a bit more than, well, quite a bit more than the PDD. So uh, we have currently 11 programs which have, which for which we have uh, signed such uh, MAT development contract, funding them with an amount of 100 to 20,000 euros to make them, uh, well, acceptable by the, by the countries and, another point, bankable. Because we are a compliance buyer, we are not a financial institution, so we do not provide equity or debt capital. We provide on a results base, basis a uh, predefined price uh, per delivered interval. The other 11 programs are, uh, they have some questions, have some outstanding questions. We're very confident then that most of them will make it to the so-called math phase as well. Where are they? Not, <laughs> not visible, not there. Just that Yeah. Well, so then leave. well, it looks better now. Looks better now, maybe. No. I don't know, apologize for this. He was working the whole day.
Okay, now it's working. Um, I mean, now Now it's working. Looks better. Great. So uh, let's continue. It seems to be stable now. Where are these programs located? Um, we have uh, of these 22 pre selected programs, most of them are based in Africa or located in Africa, followed by Latin American, Caribbean, Asia, and Eastern Europe. Um, of the 11 programs we are currently developing, financing the development, uh, seven are in Africa, three in Latin America, and one in the Caribbean. These programs apply different kinds of technologies, renewable energy, biogas to energy, waste management, and energy efficiency. To give you an example, two examples, uh, one is the green credit line in Peru. It's rather a financial tool we develop where we provide de-risking uh, through guarantees to local banks who then in turn finance energy efficiency measures in small and medium enterprises in, in Peru. The program structuring is, is, is ongoing. That's this mad development. We expect to have that uh, finalized soon. And this all will, be, will work on the bilateral agreement uh, between Peru and Switzerland signed last year. Uh, it's an estimate. The ATMA volume we expect from that program is in the sort of 750,000. Uh, uh, it's most cumulative until 2030. The term will be tw between 2022 and 2030. Another example is the NCEP program in Ghana, that's a national clean energy program, which is designed to improve uh, access to clean and affordable energy across Ghana through uh, the provision of results-based payments and secure concessional loans. Here as well, both of these programs are advanced in the MAD development. Uh, as for Peru, the bilateral agreement with Ghana was signed last year, and it has similar size, an expected similar size as the program in Peru, Peru i.e. around 750,000 tons cumulative to 2030. So that's not enough <laughs> to fulfill our, our, our target. Uh, we have to do more. Um, we want to do more. We are ready to finance more. And um, therefore, we have currently an ongoing call for proposal. It's the fourth one, which ends in the end of January 2022, uh, where we invite everybody to provide uh, suitable program ideas to us through our standardized uh, uh, online format. We expect to have first authorizations and implementation of, in 2022. Well, fingers crossed. <laughs> and uh, for all the, the countries which have entered a bilateral agreement with uh, Switzerland, we open 
the floor, if you will, we open the, the, the tender and accept programs uh, without any deadlines or, or limits. So it, this is currently the case for Peru and Ghana. We have separate uh, platforms, well, websites through which we source and manage these programs. Uh, there you can get all the information how you can submit the program to us. As said, you could do that anytime. To stay informed, you can sub subscribe to our newsletter. And with this, I hand over back to you, Misha. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, Michael. Yeah. So, without further ado, I'd like to invite my, uh, Axel and try to. Thank you very much, Misha, and I'm really happy to be part of this event um, to discuss yeah, what are the conditions that we actually need to enable such pioneering efforts like those undertaken uh, by, by CLIC. Uh, so we have been looking at Article 6 readiness, especially in the context of the update of the nationally determined contribution. And what is extremely important is to understand that such readiness is not only relevant for host countries, but also for buyer countries. Uh, most often there is always the thinking, well, the host country has low capacity, but the buyer country knows everything it uh, needs to do. That's not the case. The readiness needs to be built on both sides. And also it's a dynamic process. What in uh, uh, this year is pioneering in two years time, maybe run of the mill. Uh, so, what we've been doing in a recent study that is also publicly available is relating to what are the key components of Article 6 readiness. And the first one, of course, is to have a strategy. As has been said, Switzerland and, of course, through the vehicle of the CLIP Foundation, has a clear strategy. But, of course, also such strategies uh, can be impacted. Uh, there was a referendum in Switzerland last, well, in June this year that destroyed the domestic foundation of climate policy, essentially. And now, of course, the Swiss strategy needs to be built up again. Fortunately, the CLIP contracts seem not to be endangered by this problem. But it shows that even in the context of a very rich and well-organized countries, uh, the strategic uh, approach is, is crucial. Then, of course, very important is governance and institution development. And you will hear, of course, from the other panelists on how this has been resolved in specific uh, CLIC contexts, but one cannot underestimate this aspect. And then last but not least, the third pillar, monitoring. And I'm really glad that Ken Newcomb is on this panel, because Ken has been pioneering really interesting monitoring approaches upscaling for technologies where one was thinking it would not be possible. So these three pillars of readiness uh, we have been looking at. And of course, we what we were first looking into is, yeah, will countries have a pure strategy or may they also have a mixed strategy? There could be cases where, for example, a government lets it open to the private sector, whether they actually want to buy or sell it most. Of course, they all need authorization, but one could imagine a government that plays the market in both directions. And so far, of course, this had not been discussed to any extent. And of course, strategies may change over time. A country that develops fast may initially be a pure seller and then over time become a buyer. I'm looking forward to what happens with China and India as they come close to their net zero targets. They may change their strategy but of course, this would not come in a sudden manner, what would have to be prepared in the long run. Um, of course, NDCs are difficult animals. We all know they are nationally determined. There is no guardrails how to set up, 
set up an NDC. And that, of course, means that in the NDC updates, also, we have no clear common approach to Article 6 uh, readiness that is enshrined in these NDCs. Um, and also, of course, we don't know exactly how NDCs are going to be implemented. In many countries, there is a flurry of documents that can be seen as part of NDC implementation plans, but there is no structured process. And again, this of course means that the Article 6 readiness somehow needs to be brought into this process of developing such documentation. So what we did is we looked at the NDC updates that had been made prior to the COP. So we didn't look at the flurry of new submissions that happened in the past two weeks, but at those that existed previously. And what one can really say is that the majority of countries that submitted some NDC that mentioned that the NDC would include Article 6 action did not really specify a strategy. And what was also quite interesting to see that even the generic approach to buying and selling was not specified. So 30% of those NDCs said we want to sell, only 10% said we want to buy, and the rest didn't say anything. Of course, we would assume that most of those countries would be sellers, at least from their overall level of development, but it is not clearly specified. Um, also, when you now look at the characteristics of how uh, Article 6 has been specified in the NDCs. We see about half of the countries stating some objective and conditions. Uh, we only have very few countries, surprisingly, that make clear reference to sustainable development. That's strange because in the discussions about Article 6, so many people said, oh, there needs to be more focus on sustainable development compared to the CDM. But yeah, if you look at the documentation, it's not really the case. Um, so we did a few case studies on countries. We really did look at uh, the assessment of uh, desk uh, documents that were available, but also interviewed a few people we know in these countries. And we these are all countries that foresee a significant role for Article 6. So in Colombia, and Colombia of course has a number of Article 6 pilots, it's quite interesting that the government is rather passive on the actual Article 6 strategy. So of course that makes it difficult for those entities who engage in Article 6 pilots to actually really get to grips with how the pilot can be specified specifically. Ethiopia is quite eager to engage and very strongly stated it wants to uh, set up pilot activities. But of course, we've seen in the Ethiopian case the chilling effect of political crisis. Uh, the civil war, of course, has not been really beneficial for Article 6 piloting and strategic uh, development. And Vietnam is interesting in a sense that they've put a lot of effort now to develop a domestic market strategy, so developing an ETS, developing a carbon tax depending on the sectors, but also remaining rather opaque on how they actually want to do the Article 6 strategy. Recently there was a statement by Korea that the Korea would have agreed on an Article 6 piloting and uh, bilateral approach with Vietnam, but when you talk to the Vietnamese entities, they say, hmm, this is not as clear as some Korean uh, press release uh, actually stated. Uh, so, uh, oh, no, I'm stuck here a bit. Let me see um, what to do here. No, unfortunately, somehow the screen has now shifted and I can't, can't move on. Mishra, can you check? Oh, okay, good. Let's hope it works now again. Yes, perfect. On bias strategies, I don't want to carry oaths to Athens. Click strategy you've heard already. 
Interestingly, there's the one other country having a good buyer strategy, that's Japan, with a joint crediting mechanism, very elaborate approaches. What is key with these buyer strategies is trust building and capacity building in the partner countries. And of course, also to see how these two-layer processes of the government-to-government -government, uh, agreements and then the private sector or public sector transactions that are on the second layer are being dealt with. But yeah, Click has been doing quite a lot of interesting work there. So to conclude, um, we have a strengthened interest of countries to engage in Article 6 in the updated NDCs, but it's not really corroborated. It's just a kind of placeholder. And we would hope that now with more piloting and more bilateral agreement, we get a clearer view on how the countries actually want to do it. Um, what is also very important is if capacity building is undertaken, we should not be a repetition of what we had under the CDM, where 10 donors descended on a country, did 100 workshops, the officials didn't do their work, but spent the time in the workshops getting the daily subsistence allowance for these workshops. So we really need to learn from these uh, past lessons and yeah, don't repeat uh, this. So with that, I would like to give back to Misha and thank you for the invitation to the workshop and looking forward to the discussion. Thank you, Axel, for this intervention. From a more analytical perspective, and I, I'd really like to invite now Maya, um, who is now from a more um, concrete uh, country perspective, and I try to quickly um, good. Excellent. Good afternoon, colleagues. Uh, my name is Maya with a complicated name indeed from Georgia. Uh, so I'll try to present about our uh, still modest but experience regarding the Article 6 cooperation and cooperation with the CLIC. Uh, before I go to the um, Article 6 itself, just briefly, we'll have elaborate about the NDC of Georgia. Uh, so, um, in April 2021, we have adopted our updated NDC. So, we have two like unconditional and conditional targets. Um, we say that uh, we would reduce the JG emissions by 35% uh, from the 1990 level unconditionally, so by our own. And then we have the conditional uh, commitment for 58-57% reduction. Additionally, our NDC uh, says about exploring the adaptation capacities and the, uh, implementing the adaptation measures. Uh, the implementation timeline is 2021-2030, and base year is, of course, uh, 1990. Uh, an interesting part uh, in our NDC is that we have the sectorial targets, and as far as, far as I remember, there are just like uh, slightly more than 10 countries who are having the sectorial targets. Uh, particularly, you know, we say that uh, we will reduce the uh, emissions in the transport sector uh, by 15% uh, from the BAU scenario. Uh, we say that we will reduce the, so we have the emission reduction, reduction targets in the energy generation and transmission also by 15%, uh, industry by 5%, and we say that we will increase the carbon sink capacity of Georgian forest by 10%. Uh, for the other sectors, such as the uh, buildings, uh, the uh, waste sector, and also the agricultural sector, we don't have the concrete like cap or uh, in the mitigation parts, uh, which was due to uh, lack of measures that we have identified that could help us in achieving our, especially the uh, unconditional targets. Um, there was mention about the readiness and whether the countries are ready to, to cooperate about uh, on the Article 6. Uh, and one important issue in terms of the readiness is strategy. So we, uh, together with the NDC, we have also adopted the Georgia's 2030 Climate Change Strategy and Action Plan. Uh, 
which gives us the clear picture and clear guidance how we should implement those uh, measures. So the strategy itself follows the NDC targets, uh, sectorial targets, and the aim of the strategy is, of course, to implement the uh, unconditional part of the Georgia's NDC. So there is a seven sector also that is covered under the NDC of Georgia, uh, and so we have uh, the concrete action plan in, under each sector, so we know how we would implement uh, those measures uh, and those targets. Uh, it's interesting that within this strategy also we have split the conditional and unconditional measures. So the conditionals are where we yet have a deficit. So we would say that we would seek the climate finance for that, or we would seek the cooperation like the Article 6 and the key one, uh, particularly for those type of the, of the measures. Um, about the uh, bilateral agreement with Switzerland, which was signed uh, just recently uh, between uh, in, in Switzerland, I think it was like two weeks ago. Uh, so we have initiated the process in 2019 uh, in Madrid, uh, and it lasts quite a while, uh, adding on the, the COVID and all, all those issues that, that required more time. So we finalized the process in 2021. Uh, in order, but, but like when you have the agreements, this is just like first step when you are starting some, something. So in order to keep it uh, um, open and keep it at the higher level, uh, Georgia has also established the Climate Change Council, uh, which is the high level council under the government of Georgia, uh, which consists from the all line ministers, uh, like the sectorial ministers. And currently we are in the process of creating the working group for the Article 6. Uh, which will uh, do all the technical work and which will um, um, mostly uh, be uh, the advising body of the Climate Change Council uh, who will coordinate all the process. So they will be in charge of uh, developing the, whether it's authorization or verification schemes, or also the monitoring system and etc. However, this is still upcoming. Uh, in terms of the um, uh, expectations regarding the Article 6, so we have short term and the longer term expectation and the short term we are working already with the Click foundation uh, on the energy efficient buildings pro program i mean it, we are starting to work on that uh, as well because we are currently in the process of having the um, consultant to develop the project proposal uh, with all the details um, so we are also in the process of identifying the other potential projects that can uh, fit with the work with the CLIC and with this Article 6 cooperation. Uh, in the long term, uh, we expect that this type of cooperation will help us, uh, Georgia, uh, in uh, mostly decarbonizing this key uh, economic sectors. And uh, in an even longer term, uh, we hope that it will support us in increasing our NDC ambition and especially the longer term um, positivity to say of that would be even after 2023, when we managed to more or less decarbonize our economies, uh, which we have stated in our long-term climate development strategies. So this is very brief. Uh, thank you very much. If you have any questions, I would be happy to answer please. Thank you, Maya, for that. This was really good. Now, I think Ken, can it's I mean you don't have slides, you can sit there oh. or you can stand as you wish. Okay, and I quickly turn it off. change the slide to a neutral thing. Oh. You Thank you. Well I'm gonna relieve you of the burden of faulty software. And this try and paint a picture in words so you can let your imagination run right. So first about Sequest Capital, uh, we're focused on providing clean energy and sustainable land management solutions for the rural poor worldwide. Um, but obviously developing countries and we're focused mostly in the least developed countries. Uh, we are in addition really concerned about the health and well-being and prosperity of women and girls and children. And so much of our work uh, takes into account how we're contributing to their welfare. 
women, as you undoubtedly know, are the engines of economic growth in many parts of the world, but that's certainly true in the rural areas of developing countries. And if we can't find prosperity for them, uh, then much of what it's going to take to create a climate resilient future will be left behind. The government of Malawi is our partner in this business. And I'm very proud to have them as a partner. Malawi is the hub of our sub-Saharan African business. We've been there for more than a decade, uh, striving hard to figure out how we can help them uh, to cope with a climate constrained future. So it's exciting to me that the Click Foundation and the government of Switzerland has seen fit to take us this far in this partnership and to move towards a bilateral agreement. I'm also really impressed about the opportunity of, of Article 6.2. To my mind, the whole carbon market is about transforming land use and energy systems and livelihoods to cope with a climate constrained world, to give rise to climate resilience. Um, and to secure the livelihoods of the poor in the face of these disruptive changes. And Article 6.2, I think, brings together the right visions to make these necessary transformations happen. So Sequest is about transformation. We're about transforming clean cooking to a sustainable future with sustainable fuels. We're about transforming agriculture to regenerative climate friendly and climate resilient solutions and energy solutions, including storage systems that can alleviate, actually mitigate the need for fossil fuels by bringing things like solar into 24 seven base load power. The catalytic power of 6.2 in bringing people like the Click Foundation and the Swiss government and their developing country partners into a, a vision of transformation which needs to be underwritten by risk capital is really fundamental. On the one hand, this pool of risk capital is essential to take the many risks in new technologies and behavior change in particular. Behavior change is our single biggest problem for people who've been wedded to practices which are no longer compatible with sustainable livelihoods, sometimes for thousands of years but certainly for decades. Investing in the technologies and the software and training to bring about these changes is the most difficult challenge. Technology is not as difficult, but it's important. So what is this project about? Well, we call it the Lilongwe project. So Lilongwe is the capital of Malawi. And it has four components. And it's not just the Click Foundation funding or the, the impetus of an emissions reductions purchase agreement, which is going to generate the financing. It's actually a, a partnership between the voluntary carbon market at large, Sequest itself, the government of Malawi in terms of facilitation um, and the financing um, support and encouragement of the Click Foundation. It is designed to create an open fire, fire free zone Get away from that. An open fire free zone within a 50 kilometer radius of the long way. That means all use of open fires for cooking, mostly by households, but also by food stalls, roadside stalls, and enterprises, is to be eliminated within a five year period. It is to reduce the use of charcoal dramatically in urban households. But the nominal target still to be defined through a lot of analysis of how many households are involved of 100,000 households being switched away from charcoal to a cleaner, more sustainable, higher amenity set of technologies and fuels, some of which are in development, some of which we've tested uh, confident about as commercial alternatives. It's about creating the opportunity for women entrepreneurs within a hundred kilometer radius to supply fuels on a sustainable basis as the sustainable alternative new fuels to replace charcoal. We do that through distribution of bamboo, but there are other uh, trees and agroforestry systems which we're actively exploring and, and, and pioneering. 
but this year, for example, we will distribute 350,000 bamboo seedlings to households who have 350,000 of our stoves. On the basis they keep our stove going, they get a bamboo seedling every year. But in the future, under this project, those who have kept their stove going and have kept their bamboo seedlings alive will be rewarded with five or 10 seedlings or 20 seedlings. So they can become entrepreneurs selling back to us and our affiliates a sustainable fuel. And by the way, every day in Malawi, we are installing our rural cook stove solution, two stoves, in a thousand households, but 2,000 stoves a day currently. Across sub Saharan Africa, it's 3,000 households and 6,000 stoves a day. The last component is the food store. You might think about food stores as a major source of consumption of, of, uh, of firewood, but in fact, they are the, the central focus of open fire cooking in, in the urban areas. And there are probably 10,000 food stalls, we're doing a census right now, in the Lilongwe area, and 20, 30,000 across the country. So it's very common across sub-Saharan Africa to see food stalls cooking 10 in the morning to 10 at night or whatever. And we hope to uh, convert all of them over this five year period to cleaner, faster technology, um, and to supply them on a daily basis with sustainable biomass fuels. I don't know whether you realize it, but it's possible to grow on 5% of the land within a 100 kilometer radius of a city of a million people, all of the biomass fuel that they need to replace charcoal. The challenge is to make the transition. Every 1% of urbanization in Africa gives rise to 14% increase in demand for charcoal. Charcoal is the single most destructive energy source on the planet. It's a huge source of destruction of forests, sometimes absolutely systematic and targeted area by area, mostly undercover and is not susceptible to new technology, which could improve conversion ratios. So earthen kilns are really using between 10 and 15 tons of wood for every ton of charcoal. It's the most miserable job you can imagine. And the people who make charcoal don't get the money. It's the intermediaries who transport it and the retailers. But once you've made the transition to charcoal, it's certainly a lot cleaner and can be used indoors than firewood. So it's very hard to go back to an alternative source. In the development finance institutions to which I belong for some period of time, probably too long, um, the truth is, everybody believed in the energy lab. That, of course, charcoal is going to go away because, like everywhere else in the world, who may have used wood or charcoal, they go to LPG, kerosene, LPG, electricity. But the ladder's broken. So 80% of the urban populations in Africa use charcoal. And there's not much choice. Distribution of LPG is very weak in landlocked countries, still embryonic, even on the coast, and electrification is stalled. 9% of households are, are electrified in the long way, I mean in Malawi. So what to do about it? It, it is both a technological challenge, which needs to be underwritten by this important source of risk capital, and it's a behavior change challenge. And we're working uh, on all of those. The social problem is very many of our clients getting our rural stoves today make charcoal as their food runs out. It's the kind of social safety net. Of, you know, and, and that means that this, uh, it's a vicious cycle of downward degradation. We hope to wean them off that. That's the picture. I hope it's got your imagination going. So thank you very much. Absolutely, Ken. Um, I think this is exactly why we why we work together. <laughs> we share the same like picture in a way. Um, so, and I think you, you alluded to, to two different levels: the, the one about progression and development of fuels towards cleaner fuels. This is not this is a 
an evolution. And the other one is about business. It needs to have or to a business environment needs to be created because uh, you cannot buy mitigation outcome, but you can only create an environment, a socio-economic political environment that leads to an increased uh, pickup of uh, climate friendly alternatives. And speaking of technologies, I'm really happy to hand over to Sergi, who has also already uh, experience exactly in doing that. And um, I will quickly pull up the slides. Which are there is an animation. Uh -huh. Whoa. Thank you, everyone, for assisting tonight, uh, this afternoon. Uh, thanks, thanks, Axel, Maya, uh, Misha, uh, Michael, Ken, uh, for joining this afternoon presentation. Uh, obviously, thanks to the Click Foundation and thanks to AIDA for hosting this event. Um, I started my career uh, <clears throat> with the implementation of the very first projects under the Clean Development Mechanism, also on the BCS, uh, of also on the Gold Standard. And now with more than 18 years of experience, I think I've got the board of all these DOE, EP, going back and forwards. Um, uh, with all more than 100 projects, I think now is the time to start looking at the voluntary carbon market and also to the compliance market in a different way. Uh, I've been working mainly on waste management projects, renewable energy and forestry. I'm currently the Chief Strategy and Innovation Officer of Alcrop, and uh, for a decade I have been CDM consultant in waste management sector for the World Bank and a member of the UNFCCC roster of experts for CDM methodologies. Um, so the objective of my presentation to, uh, this afternoon will be uh, on technology options to, operate, to the operationalization of Article 6. Uh, and I would like to provide to you a little bit of uh, practical views from the project developer perspective, uh, as output is. Uh, on the different Article 6 activities, especially on Article 6.2, but also as well on Article 6.2. Yeah. Yeah. So, ALCO develops projects that reduce greenhouse gas emissions, uh, measuring the co benefits through the SDGs. Uh, our company works in different building blocks uh, like climate change, mitigation, and adaptation. Also in transparency, technology transfer, finance, capacity building, innovation management, and sustainability, providing solutions to private and public sectors in the implementation project of the Paris Agreement under Article 6, but also in the 2030 agenda through the SDGs. So, just to give you a brief on our practical uh, examples on implementation of Article 6. Uh, I want to first say that despite this uh, continued uncertainty uh, regarding the finalization of Article 6 rules, uh, some practical Article 6 initiatives have evolved. Uh, since 2018, Alcott is working in different Article 6 piloting activities uh, without any room. <laughs> Uh, while this house country's uh, readiness work is progressing and the voluntary carbon marking is starting to change in anticipation of the Article 6 rules. Uh, these are well, some examples uh, of the different activities that we are conducting. Under Article 6.2, as mentioned by 
uh, by Michael, we are working in two consulting uh, contracts for sustainable waste management projects in the whole country in Senegal and Ghana to provide IPMOS to Switzerland through the Click Foundation. Uh, specifically, this is interesting, I think, in the, to, the, to the audience that probably we have one of the very only developers that we are also working on developing the MADDs on sustainable livestock management to produce biogas in Dominican Republic. Uh, to provide ITMOS to Sweden through the Swedish Energy Agency. Uh, this project still hasn't been awarded, but we have been working on the uh, pre-MADD, which uh, for the audience also is important to understand that this is the mitigation action design document in the old days called PDD. Um, under Article 6.4, where we are developing our, where we are at the moment, has around 60 projects in 16 countries. Uh, mainly in Latin America and Africa, um, with a portfolio of 17 million tons of CO2 per year. Therefore, under Article 6.2, I 6.4, is very important for us to understand how we can transform those projects and to see whether they have any value on Article uh, 6.4. So, therefore, we have started already to look into the CDM and BCM methodologies in order to. Uh, check on the baseline and the additionality um, to see whether they would be applicable under Article 6.4. Um, the idea is that we are looking into applying country ambition coefficients, as recommended by our friend Axel. Um, this can uh, improve our, uh, our portfolio to make it uh, somehow compliant in the future Article 6.4. We are also under Article 6.4 uh, formulating an MRB blockchain technology to allow corresponding adjustments and transparency for the buyer and the selling countries. And uh, under Article 6.8, which is the known market mechanism, we are working in, uh, in development of uh, what is called is a program for delivery adaptation benefits in Africa, pilot, piloting the adaptation benefit mechanism. Mm -hmm which is through the African Development Bank, uh, to be conducted in Senegal. Uh, and the project is called Recycled Plastic for Construction in Africa, Empowering Women. Uh, we also have developed uh, a tool called Namaksu, which uh, has been, uh, it was presented back in, in the previous COP25 in Madrid. The, the tool is called Namaksu and is designed by Alpo to identify and quantify and understand the impact of sustainable development goals at the project level. So, as uh, has been mentioned by, by Axel, the engagement conditions for Article 6 are uh, not very easy to be looked at it under, under one angle. Uh, the, Paris, the Paris Agreement provides a fundamental new framework for global climate policies, including the possibility for signatory parties to cooperate on implementing policies approach. In relation to the international carbon market, the rules to be adopted, hopefully this week, will have to consider the nexus of NDC, accounting, and the various mechanisms mechanism for implementing the voluntary cooperation that countries will engage in. If we need to cover, in particular, the avoidance of the volcanism, additionality issues of Article 6 mechanism, and other issues that could jeopardize environmental integrity in the generation and transfer of mitigation outcomes, as well as ensuring transparency, good governance, and the necessary institutional infrastructure, it will also be needed considering the key role of carbon markets. Uh, that can have in enabling the encouraging, creating mitigation ambition and bringing uh, about sectoral transformation. So, in order to have a solid basis uh, on which individual projects house countries should ideally have, I have put here like uh, four bullet points. Uh, I can see that projects, uh, countries will need to have a recent and accurate greenhouse gas inventory and hopefully using tier three IPCC guidelines with methodologies which are more or less in line with CDM methodologies. Also, it's uh, interesting that the countries have a clear formulated NDC that are right compared to the inventory levels with uh, conditional and non-conditional mitigation actions, 
and also the bottom-up approach of mitigation actions uh, defining baseline scenario and financial needs. This is very important because if uh, the, the MDC upfront doesn't have this conditional and non-conditional differentiation in the different mitigation actions, it's very difficult for the, current, for the buyer, for the country buyer, to understand what are the financial needs. Uh, in terms of this bottom-up approach, um, I, I think it's very interesting to understand that the NDCs sometimes are built up on top-down approach. And we can see that there, there are lots of uh, NDCs based on political will rather than a technical will. So how I see these NDCs, hopefully, or probably Axel, you can correct me if I'm wrong, but I would see that those mitigation actions are based on PEDs, more or less. Uh, the approach would be that you have your approach, you have your boundary, and then you build up the project as a mitigation action as it would be under the CDM. And then all the accountability, all the timing, all the framework, all the finance can be also looked into uh, through that, uh, from that perspective. Uh, and also it's important that the countries have the ability to uh, understand what are the macros of their specific mitigation action uh, in order to determine the abatement cost and the financial needs. This is very important because when uh, host countries start uh, conducting negotiations with buyer countries, then they have the understanding of what is the abatement cost in, uh, of that technology in their own country, so that can be very well prepared for negotiations. So in terms of benefits from Article 6.2 for host countries, I uh, need to say that we, while these Article 6 activities are confronted with multiple barriers, none have been uh, an actual deal breaker. Enabling initiatives that can support parties in moving further along the implementation chain are crucial to overcome those barriers. This uh, seems to be increasingly recognizing uh, as such in, uh, initiatives are emerging in larger numbers, as we could see uh, with uh, Michael's presentation. A successful conclusion from my point of view of Article 6 negotiation at COP26 is not seen as necessary condition, uh, at least for the uh, private sector, for the continuation of Article 6 pilots. And we see that many benefits on the engagement in Article 6 benefiting, are benefiting already host countries in different ways, as you can see in the slide. So basically, I can see that re revenue generation to achieve the host country NDC is one of the main benefits. Uh, as you can see, also the Article 6 cooperation can potentially boost the local economy of host countries as a vehicle for foreign investments into the country. Uh, producing emissions in their NDC. Also, the technology transfer is a very good uh, benefit for the host country, uh, considering the Article 6 could be used uh, to kickstart and move otherwise inaccessible technologies towards mainstream adoption and include them in domestic effort for more ambition. Then, obviously, the capacity building needs to happen. Um, our our approach in all the countries that we are currently working is to have um, contracts with the universities, with local universities, in order to have a long-term capacity building. So then we can have uh, people on the ground which are fully aware of the new markets and we can uh, have this uh, uh, long-term view for the NDC of the country. Uh, obviously, the financial of high-cost measures is, uh, is another benefit and this uh, generating of sustainable development for benefits. Um, this uh, many climate change mitigation measures should be associated uh, from our point of view. And as uh, Axel said about the, that the negotiators are still not uh, including the sustainable development goals into the um, negotiating text. Uh, we can from our point of view, it is very necessary to use these uh, sustainable development co-benefits. Uh, obviously, air pollution, increased energy security, and job creation, uh, from our point of view, are the main SDGs to be uh, benefiting from this Article 6.2. So, in terms to uh, technologies and sectors which are best positioned in Article 6, I have prepared this kind of uh, uh, 
table, which explains uh, or it tried to explain a little bit on how we see uh, the unconditional and conditional NDC mitigation actions. So, as you can see in the upper left corner, you have these mature low cost technologies, which are those that the country should be able to address with its own resources. Uh, in, specifically for the project that we are developing in Senegal and Ghana, uh, the experience A2 has that 20 years uh, has happened since the CDM and the <clears throat> landfill gas projects, composting, and all these uh, projects which are, have a very low cost are not still not uh, implemented in Africa. Um, so we can see that this uh, upper left corner uh, should be based on these unconditional uh, NDC mitigation actions. Uh, when international cooperation through climate finance or of Article 6 can then be used to introduce otherwise inaccessible technologies that are emerging and which have high costs, which are uh, shown in this uh, bottom right uh, of the figure. So the technologies uh, that fall in the high cost, mature technologies and low cost emerging technologies quadrant are harder to classify as inaccessible because the market maturity in a specific country might encounter barriers beyond or in addition to technology maturity and cost. So this is, I think, is inter interesting to understand that uh, in these two axes uh, in the graph, we can see that these conditional NBC mitigation action, which hopefully are the ones which are eligible as technologies to be used under Article 6.2, uh, normally is a long-term view, so we need to uh, start with a very uh, low-cost, uh, mature technology. If they are in the NDC, it can be that there are still other barriers other than maturity and cost, and they need to be also assessed separately. So that's why I didn't give a list of uh, technologies that can be used under Article 6.2, because this hardly depends on the NDC of the country, but also on, the under, on their own understanding on how difficult it is to uh, include those technologies in their own territories. The idea is also that uh, some countries like Ghana and start, uh, are starting to create like positive list of technologies that they already oversee as a, a good candidates for uh, Article 6.2. Um, and I think this is the, the right approach, create these positive lists. So in terms of um, our own strategy on operationalizing the Article 6 on project source, uh, we see the accounting rules uh, under the enhanced transparency framework as a sufficient basis uh, for collaboration. We see also the uh, San Jose principles for high admission and integrity international carbon markets signed by over 30 con countries as a good uh, framework. Uh, we are very active in promoting the Fair Carbon Alliance last month in Latin America uh, Climate Week in Cartagena, uh, which, by the way, we are promoting at COP26, but engaging more countries. Uh, from West and East African Alliance, as well as some Latin American countries and some governments. Uh, we've seen last week as well that the Global Methane Initiative has been signed, uh, and that, I think, can also be used uh, for engagement of Article 6.2. Um, another failure to establish these clear rules of Article 6 will serve as a setback uh, for multilateral government carbon markets. Uh, reaching the scale of international carbon markets necessary to enhance ambitions commensurates with the long-term targets of the Paris Agreement. And this will not be possible in a world of fragmented bilateral agreements. Therefore, reaching an agreement on the Article 6 rulebook at COP26 this week is essential to ensure the transformational potential of future carbon markets. And as project developers, uh, we are looking for projects that will fulfill more or less the criteria that you have in the, in the screen. Uh, from our point of view, the project meets the criteria. The first thing is uh, environmental integrity, which means that the project needs to be 
uh, additional based on realistic baseline, have provision for detailed plan of MRV, uh, avoid double counting, and is permanent and is, doesn't have the cash. Uh, the proposed project also need to fall with the scope of the countries and DC, because otherwise uh, it won't be recognized by the host country. Uh, the project uh, would need to be Paris, uh, Paris Agreement aligned uh, in that uh, sense that it contributes to uh, and it's in line with the country's decarbonization pathway. Uh, that the project is inaccessible in that in beyond the scope of the government planning and ability that is needed for the NDC implementation now or in the future, and alternative sources of climate finance are not available. Finally, the project will need to be in line with the sustainable development priorities and needs to promote uh, projects on human rights and complies with international legal obligations. Yeah, so well, thank you very much for uh, your attention. And as you can see, uh, project developers like Alcott are already operalizing the Article 6 uh, activities. And we hope that the political concern in the political issue concerning Article 6 uh, negotiation, negotiations regarding uh, adaptation, regarding the compensation of CDM projects but also, uh, which by the way, those credits might not be eligible anymore in the post-2020 carbon markets, but also on the ambition of Article 6 cooperation are resolved this week. Uh, and we hope that we can keep changing the change, achieving jointly the net zero target, not by 2050, uh, as soon as uh, they let us do to do so. <laughs> so thank you very much. Uh, Thank you very much. Thank you. Wow, that was a fully fledged um, presentation on, on actually what what us in our view seems to matter under Article Six from the perspective of developing activities to avoid like un, unwanted uh, uh, frictions. Now. It's so over, over an hour now that we are <laughs> that you're sitting here listening. Uh, I'm, I'm I'm very happy to cheer you up a little bit with with prospect on the networking reception that will be in half an hour. Uh, so just when you walk out, uh, there will be a networking reception um, held by us, the Click Foundation, and um, I would really like now to to engage with you as an audience. I have tons of questions to the panel, but <laughs> I'd rather have views, and we also have questions from the virtual audience. Um, maybe to also um, prime you a little bit on, on your thinking, I'd really love to hear from you what the Click Foundation could be do better. If there is any wish list, <laughs> um, please uh, shoot, it, shoot it at us, and um, um, maybe. Yeah, I'm opening the floor to the audience now for questions. If there are no questions, immediate questions, I will go to those posed by the virtual audience. Good. Um, how is it working with the microphones? Is there any? Oh. Excellent. Oh. Please. Hi, thank you. Uh, so just if you could comment a bit on the um, analysis you did on the, the call of proposals, which are the main gaps of the project that were not selected? It's difficult to understand you. So sorry, maybe you could... I'm so sorry. Yeah, no, much better. <laughs> okay, so regarding the call of proposal that you made, mm -hmm. uh, what, which were the main gaps regarding the projects that weren't selected? So if you, you could comment a bit on that. That they lack on. Yeah, that's um, that's a good question. <laughs> I will be we we accepted a lot of them. Um, some some misunderstandings in the beginning because we 
cannot accept um, forest nature-based solutions due to the restrictions from the Swiss law, uh, which you are obliged to. And maybe Michael had a few seconds to <laughs> analyze the question a bit more. What, what were the main reasons for rejections? Um, readiness of the activity or the opposite? <laughs> Uh, that they are like being implemented and um, yeah, or then yeah. Yeah, maybe I can I can comment on this. Um, one main reason why we had to reject uh, programs was the requirement of pre-financing. So mm, there were many uh, institutions that built their program or developed their program idea uh, expecting uh, the capex to be provided by the Click Foundation. And when we said, no, that's not what we do, we're not a financial institution, um, some of them simply turned, turned back. Others, other reasons were uh, lack of detail. It's an idea, of course, it's a mitigation activity. Maybe the idea no, no to be expected, but it needs to have a certain level of detail in order to be to be accepted. And, um, and that, when it comes, for example, uh, to institutional setup, when it comes to partners, you cannot build up such a program as, as Ken pointed out without without knowing the country, without knowing what what's going on there. So. <laughs> small companies based in Europe trying to, without partnering with someone else in whatever country, that just doesn't work. And uh, of course we raised then questions, how do, will you solve that, that, that problem or how will you team up with whom? Uh, if you don't get a better, a good answer at that point in time, then that's a reason for rejection. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, you yeah. <laughs> okay, thank you. Francisca Heidenreich from My Climate. I have a quick question to all of you. You can stay the wish. Um, what do you expect from a project developer? I mean, we have a range of different roles here on the panel host country, project partner, co project developer, academia. What do you expect from us as project developers? So, the question is directed to the panel. I give the panel the opportunity to react on that, Axel. <laughs> okay, thank you. Yeah, and the project developers should adjust to the new realities of the Paris Agreement. So, any old style stuff of business as usual baseline, not taking into account the policy development in the host country. Um, yeah, thinking that additionality is no longer relevant, this doesn't fly. Uh, so, and also, of course, uh, Article 6 has a much stronger engagement of governments. CDM was purely normally government gave an approval letter and government hadn't had any stake in it. So they churned out the approval letter very easily. Now a good government needs to check. Yeah, how does this activity relate to the NDC? So the project developer proactively needs to engage with all relevant government institutions. And this I've seen lacking in many project developers approaches to Article 6. Yeah, I mean, lying with that, uh, I mean, our our role will be more in mediating between countries now to understand what are the needs from the carbon buyer as it would be a, a private company, which they they have the wish list of uh, the best carbon abatement project. So then you you need to feed uh, the, the you know what is the offer and what uh, what is the what you have in the different countries. So it's an IT IT process that you need to, to start doing with the host country and the buyer country. Uh, so we see our our role to be between the countries, but also to engage the private sector on technology transfer and also with financial institutions to 
to give uh, them the, uh, the the reduction of the risk based on our portfolio of projects. So uh, I can see that project developers nowadays are becoming a little bit more in the central role of uh, you know countries, uh, financial institutions, uh, technology providers, but also capacity buildings uh, with universities and. Um, and you know the, we are in a central role, I think, of the new uh, Article Six of the Paris Agreement. Uh, I'll be very brief uh, from the government perspective. Uh, as far as we, at least in, in our case, we already know uh, what are our priorities, so we would expect a good project proposal from the project developer, probably, like with the technicalities and so on. Sensitization, communication, intermediation, and facilitation. It's a much bigger role than just being a project developer in, this, in the world of the voluntary carbon market, delivering emissions reductions for net zero objectives of corporates. And it requires a great deal of understanding of what government wants and um, apprising them of the consistency with their own policies and giving them confidence that you're working in their interests and that you will communicate effectively and give them honest feedback about how they can play their role of policy change and, and, um, and capacity building for implementation of shared objectives. Much more complex business. Yeah, <laughs> I'd like to give my 20 cents on that. And thank you, Ken. This is, um, I think this is an, a very important point. Um, that also alludes to this like economic situation of project developers. They have to run a business and um, sensi they, they're not paid for sensitization. So there needs to be a kind of a, of a, of a bridge, <laughs> of bridging the two roles, uh, making profit to, um, to run a business. Uh, meanwhile, doing sensitizations. And this is exactly where we want to locate our activities um, that they that they ultimately lead to a uh, transformational effect uh, by um, sensitizing uh, people and yeah I had another 20 cents but I think I give over all right can I come in please yes. I have, I have yes. a question all right I oh, know uh, there was one gentleman before still oh. waiting yeah. um, And Alex. Hello, uh, this is Rose from Inking International. Uh, in, uh, in line with uh, this last question, uh, I would like to you know, uh, learn uh, this, the speaker's uh, opinion on the uh, future of uh, grid connected renewable energy uh, projects. Because as uh, project developers, we are uh, you know, having difficulties to show that most of the projects are uh, additional or not. Uh, nowadays, and uh, many of the existing uh, carbon standards have stopped uh, registering new grid connected renewable energy projects, especially, especially in countries like Turkey, India, middle upper income countries. So, uh, in the future of ITMO, uh, do we have a, a bright future for uh, grid connected renewable electricity projects? I'm not, you know, uh, focusing on the large scale projects, of course, but also the small scale ones. And in addition to this, uh, I mean, maybe I can uh, specifically ask Maya, uh, do you foresee uh, an increase, an increase in the types of emission reduction activities uh, in the borders, uh, borders of Georgia after uh, Article 6 is operationalized uh, within uh, Georgia? Uh, thank you. Okay, thank you. I think um, my question was the second part of the question. Uh, yes, we do. Uh, we think that it will uh, kind of support the further emission reduction because uh, so we have our NDC, we have our targets, and we know how do we reach those targets. The cooperation with the uh, CLIC Foundation, I mean, with Switzerland uh, regarding the ISMOS are the top uh, on the NDC. So. The ones that we already have in our NDCs, they will not be eligible to the uh, emission trading. Uh, the ones that go beyond, of course, they will. 
And in the long term, it of course will uh, support the emission reduction because, for example, in our case, uh, with the bilateral with Switzerland is until 2030, let, let's say within the Paris Agreement, right? But we have target by until 2050. So, yes, <laughs> shortly. Thank you. Um, yeah, it's basically my also my uh, answering to. Um, it's ultimately it's the, the, the states, the governments who and and the Paris Rule Book who decides this question. I mean, uh, we from a from a bias perspective, compliance bias perspective, we are we would not go into large scale uh, renewable electricity for a variety of reasons. Uh, one obvious is that it is uh, not allowed by law uh, to you to be used as a compliance instrument for us. And second. Um, if we start uh, interfering with the low-hanging fruits with the host country government, uh, this will not end well. So we better keep our fingers from that anyways. Um, yeah. So, yeah. All right. My name is Malan from Gambia. Um, I've seen from your presentations that uh, you've been working in Senegal and in Ghana. Um, I would like to know um, one of the specific objectives um, that you work on the lines, whether you've really been able to get um, a resource that can be replicated to some of our countries. And then the other thing is um, I have a women uh, development center. That means we work on um, um, girls trying to do um, renewable energy um, project. So we have installed uh, more than uh, almost um, one mega. So the, my main interest is to see how do we um, get into this carbon market, you know, uh, because we've been trying with the Ministry of um, um, Environment, but um, several years we were not able to do anything. So how is the possibility to see my country within your, your, your framework of working? Thank you. Yeah, this is a clear pitch to us. <laughs> so we can talk this uh, after this. We have... Um, a call for proposal running. We have uh, other possibilities to receive uh, uh, idea proposals, and we typically start from a very concrete uh, idea. And uh, this also involves um, a bilateral uh, or the starting of bilateral uh, deliberations, whether or not Switzerland and your country would engage uh, on a bilateral level. So, because these both elements are uh, required. Good. So we are reaching now the six o'clock mark. We have a few minutes and uh, maybe room for one question before I also answer the questions from the virtual audience. I see you more. And this is the Okay. Yes, I'm Ingo Poo from Salzburg. I have a question for Ken and for Sergei. Um, assuming that in your programs you have carbon credits that you sell in the voluntary market, in addition to under bilateral agreements, what's your recommendation to government to how to account for that and how to address that to you know provide safeguards? It's actually um, um, a pertinent question with respect to the program that I outlined because the the open fire free zone is not funded by uh, and is not financed on the basis of a of a click itmo uh, mopa or a purchase agreement it's financed through voluntary market commitments um, through our partner investment partners as part of a, a larger program um, and that's coming through of course a transparent standard with with published um, uh, projects and monitoring and verification procedures, so those emissions reductions will be registry-based, as well as the co-benefits that arise from those. And it's actually an interesting complement uh, complementarity between the relatively simpler, more straightforward, and I would say, I hesitate to say, probably less risky project, which is complementing the achievement of the Lalongwe project objectives with the much riskier um, and higher priced emissions reductions we're going to charge these guys to get this job done but of course there has to be um, accounting and the accounting has to be complemented ultimately i presume the world bank warehouse or something like that has to take that into account um, but uh, but there's no question that you will know 
where the emissions reductions are registered and you will see them transparently from all other cook stove activities in, in Malawi. Um, hopefully they won't have any value once uh, IPMOs are sold. And that, I think, from a project developer perspective, if once the IPMOs has been sold and the technology is there and the waste management in Ghana and Senegal is already uh, working and is, uh, you know, you've got all these compost plants and recycling centers, uh, hopefully then there is not going to be any value. That would mean that our work has been done correctly. Good. Yeah, <laughs> thank you. I hope, hope that was to your satisfaction. And yeah, so maybe the two questions from, or the three questions I, I, I run quickly through. Um, the question whether or not it must, could be used in the ETS, uh, the answer is clearly no. Because Switzerland is in the European ETS, uh, but the, the units will not be electro or physically transferred to Switzerland. They, they, they transform under the bilateral agreement and will be issued as a purely Switzerland uh, internal um, currency, carbon currency for uh, the compliance act. It's, 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 it's not fungible nowhere. And then there was a question on the de-risking in the case of, um, or generally de-risking, how we would de-risk and um, what would be the, I have to quickly <laughs> look it up, what would be the, basically the, the lost appetite of the Click Foundation. So this is still a way to go for us. The de-risking can have different forms. Uh, we are of the opinion that the letter of credit system would be the most um, practical way to, uh, to um, enter into guarantees. And the risk appetite basically, uh, or the, this will be subject to the, um, to the occurrence of default, of course. And there is always with, with guarantee facilities and a certain stretch between um, being being sound, economically that sound, and, uh, and replenished uh, if it's a uh, revolving fund, and having defaults. And ha having defaults basically means it works, <laughs> because it's taking risks, and, and, and in some cases it's not taking risks, but it's not, it's defaulting. But in the end, what for us is important is the, the ratio between uh, money spent and, and defaults, this, like the costs will, sum up to an, um, an overall price and we, 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 we do have a, 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 a willingness to pay so we have to somehow manage um, the, the loss or the default rate um, but we're not there yet of course and on Georgia specifically the question on baseline setting and technology development whether or not the technology development is reflected in the baseline by reducing the the um, yeah, or by increasing the ambition of the baseline. Um, first, um, this is subject to the development. Uh, we we have a tender out, and consultancies are planning their um, uh, or preparing their proposals. Um, but of course, uh, this will be a topic. It will also will be a topic because of what uh, Maya was uh, saying that um, it. That the credited part will be outside of the NDC. Uh, the, the building sector is an important um, plays an important role in the NDC, and we are our like activity will be outside of what Georgia is doing uh, to reach its NDC. So the question is uh, the, the answer is clearly yes. And so with with this, I come to a close, and maybe you have an answer to my question. <laughs> about what, what, we could, or what, what, what you would wish from us to do, um, except... More. <laughs> do more. More, okay. We are only the two of us. Yeah. Um, 
what they asked. <laughs> drinks, drinks, right. Yeah, the drinks. So let's go out. 